Chapter 7, Warriors Don't Cry City and state police to be there today. Officials confident. Favis says he's hoping for no unrest. U.S. keeping close eye on Little Rock. Arkansas Gazette, Monday, September 23rd, 1957. As I read the morning newspaper that Monday with all the changes, I thought maybe the headline would read, Integration Halted Again. At least this time, it seemed everybody was expecting us to arrive at Central High School and go inside for classes. As I walked back to the kitchen, I decided I would begin to mark off my days at Central High School on the big wall calendar that belonged to Grandma. I longed to see all the cross marks fill the days that would become weeks and then months. I glanced at the month of September and picked up the spot where I would put the first cross mark. If I completed the first day, Lord, please let me be strong enough to fill in this day and all the school days that follow, I whispered. It was not yet 8 o'clock when Mama and I parked at the curb just outside Mrs. Bates' home. I was surprised to see so many people milling about the yard. There was double the usual throng of news reporters. Everybody spoke in whispers. I was ushered through the crowd and into the living room where radio and news reports held everyone's attention. We nine acknowledged one another with nervous smiles and a very few whispered words. Adults nodded to each other with the kind of glances that seemed to carry secret messages as they periodically looked at their watches. The nervousness grew worse with each passing moment. People were pacing, pretending to smile, sitting a moment, then rising to pace again. After a while, I became one of those people. We were going to be late for school, no doubt, late on the first day. What would everybody think? The phone rang. It was time to be on our way. Mother Lois looked as though she were on the brink of tears. As we filed silently out of the house, I waved goodbye to her. I wanted to hug her, but I didn't want everyone to think I was a baby. Other parents milled about, looking as if they were being carted off to be hanged. As we started to walk to the cars, they cluttered, clutched at us as though they weren't completely certain we'd be coming back. We settled ourselves into two cars. Mrs. Bates was in the first car with four of the nine, and a man introduced as C.C. Mercer, another NAACP official, Frank Smith, was driving the car I rode in with the remaining four students. We watched the news reporters run to their vehicles and rev their engines. The non-white reporters seemed hesitant about getting started. They hovered together. That's when I realized it must be difficult, even dangerous, for our people to cover a story like this. We seemed at first to be driving in circles. Our driver explained that the police advised we not take the usual route because segregationists might lie in wait for us. I looked at my watch. It was after 8.30. We'd be very late arriving, even later than I had feared. Central High was located on Park Street, stretching a two-block distance between 14th and 16th Street. But the route we took confused my sense of direction. I was surprised when suddenly we pulled up to the side entrance at 16th Street, just beyond Park. Amid noise and confusion, the driver urged us to get out quickly. The white hand of a uniformed officer reached out towards the car, opening the door and pulling me toward him as his urgent voice ordered us to hurry. The roar coming from the front of the building made me glance to my right. Only a half a block away, I saw hundreds of white people, their bodies in motion, their mouths wide open as they shouted their anger. The N! Keep the N out! I sh the shouts came closer. The roar swelled as though their frenzy had been fired up by something. It took a moment to digest the fact that it was the slight of us, sight of us. Hustled along, we walked up the few concrete stairs through the heavy double doors that led inside the school and then up a few more stairs. It was like entering a darkened movie theater amid the rush of a crowd eager to get seated before the picture began, begins. I was barely able to see where we were rushing to. There were blurred images all around me as we moved up the stairs. The sounds of footsteps, words, insulting shouts, and whispered commands formed an echoing clamor. N, N, the N are in. They were talking about me. The shouting wouldn't stop. It got louder as more joined in. They're in here. Oh, God, the N are in here, one girl shouted, running ahead of us down the hallway. They got in. I smell something. You, N, better turn around and go home. I was racing to keep pace with the woman who shouted orders over her shoulders to us. Nobody had yet told us she was someone we could trust, someone we should be following. I tried to move among the angry voices, blinking, struggling to accustom my eyes to the very dim light. The unfamiliar surroundings reminded me of the inside of a museum, 
marble floors and stone walls and long winding hallways that seemed to go on forever. It was a huge cavernous building, the largest I've ever been in. Breathless, I made my legs carry me quickly past angry white faces, dodging fists that struck out at me. The principal's office is this way, whispered a petite woman in with dark hair and glasses. Hurry now, hurry. I was walking as fast as I could. Then we were shoved into an office where there were more light. Directly in front of us, behind a long counter, a row of white people, mostly women, stood staring at us as though we were the world's eighth wonder. In the daylight, I recognized Mrs. Huckabee, Central High's vice principal for girls, who had been present at several of our earlier meetings with the school board. This is Jess Matthews, the principal, she said. You remember him? No, I didn't remember him. He peered at us with an acknowledging frown and nodded, then quickly walked away. Here are your class schedules and homeroom assignments. Wait for your guides, Mrs. Huckabee said. That's when I noticed that just beyond the glass panels in the upper part of the door that led to the office clusters of students stood glaring at us. One boy opened the door and walked in yelling, You're not going to let those N stay in here, are you? All at once, Thelma Mothershed slumped down on the wooden bench just inside the door of the office. Mrs. Huckabee hustled the boy out and turned her attention to Melba, all as we all did. She was pale. Her fingers and lips blue. Breathless as she was, she mustered a faint smile and tried to reassure us. None of us wanted to leave her there with those white strangers, but Mrs. Huckabee seemed to be a take-charge person who would look after her. She ushered us out, saying we had to go. Just for an instant, I worried about how Thelma's parents would get through the huge crowd outside to pick her up if she were really ill. 3.39. That was the number of the homeroom on my card. I was assigned to the third floor. We quickly compared notes. Each of us was assigned to a different home room. Why can't any of us be in the same home room or take classes together, I asked. From behind the long desk, a man spoke in an unkind, booming voice. You wanted integration? You got integration. I turned to see the hallway swallow up my friends. None of us had an opportunity to say a real goodbye or make plans to meet. I was alone, in a daze following a muscular, stocky white woman with closely cropped straight black hair. Up the stairs I went, squeezing my way past those who first blocked my path and then shouted hurtful words at me. Frightened did not describe my state. I had moved on to terrified. My body was numb. I was only aware of my head and thoughts and visions. I had fantasized about how wonderful it would be to get inside the huge, beautiful castle I knew as Central High School. But the reality was so much bigger, darker, and more treacherous than I had imagined. I could easily get lost among its spiral staircases. The angry voices shouting at me made it all that more difficult to find my way through these unfamiliar surroundings. I was panic-stricken at the thought of losing sight of my guide. I ran to keep up with her. Move it, girly, she called back at me. Whew, one voice said, backing away from me. Others stopped and joined in his ridicule. For an instant, I stood paralyzed. Don't stop, the woman commanded. Her words snapped me into action. I scuffled to move behind her. Suddenly I felt it. The sting of a hand slapping the side of my cheek and then warm, slimy saliva on my face, dropping to the collar of my blouse. A woman stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with me, not moving. And she shouted in my face again and again. She appeared to be a little older than my mother. Her face was distorted by rage. Why don't you go home, she lashed out at me. Next thing, you'll want to marry one of our children. Mary, I thought, as I darted around. I wasn't even allowed to go on a real date. Grandma wouldn't let me marry. Besides, why would I choose to marry one of these mean little rock white people? My temples throbbed. My cheeks stung. The spit was still on my face. It was the first time I'd ever been spat upon. I felt hurt, embarrassed. I wondered if I'd catch her germs. Before I could wipe it off, my guide's harsh command summoned me to move. Get going now. Do you hear me? Move. Now. I brushed the saliva off my nose with my hand. As I entered the classroom, a hush fell over the students. The guide pointed to me to an empty seat and I walked towards it. Students sitting nearby quickly gathered their books and moved away. I sat down, surrounded by empty seats, feeling unbearably self-conscious. Still, I was relieved to be off my feet. I was disoriented as though my world were blurred and leaning to the left, like a photograph snapped from a twisted angle out of focus. A middle-aged woman, who I assumed to be the teacher, ignored me. Open your books to page 12, she said, without allowing her eyes to acknowledge me. Are you going to let that N. Kuhn sit in our class, a boy shouted as he glared at me. I waited for the teacher to say or do something. Now class, 
if you've done the homework, then you know. A loud voice cut her off, shouting, We can kick the crap out of this end. The heckler continued, Look, it's 20 of us and one of her. They ain't nothing but animals. Again, I waited for the teacher to speak up, but she said nothing. Some of the students snickered. The boy took his seat, but he kept shouting ugly words at me throughout the rest of the class. My heart was weeping, but I squeezed back tears. I squared my shoulders and tried to remember what Grandma India had said. God loves you, child, no matter what. He sees you as his precious idea. Walking the gauntlet to my next class was even more harrowing. I had to go out behind the school through the girls' dressing room, down along concrete walkway, and onto the playing field. You better watch yourself, the guide warned as we moved at high speed through the hostile students. As we went outside to the walkway in the back of the school, I could hear the roar of the crowd in front of the school. It was even more deafening than the jeers immediately around me. On the playing field, groups of girls were tossing a volleyball. The teacher appeared to, appeared to be a no-nonsense person with pleasant smile. She pointed me to a spot near the net and warned the other girls not to bother me. Let's keep the game going, girls, she said in a matter-of-fact way. The girls paused for a moment, looked at one another, looked at me, and then began tossing the ball back and forth. For just one instant, I was actually concerned about whether or not I could hit the ball and score. It took me a moment to realize it was whizzing awfully close to my head. I ducked, but they hit me real hard, shouting and cheering as they found their target. And even as I was struggling to escape their cruelty, I was at the same time more terrified by the sound of the angry crowd in the distance. It must be enormous, I thought. How would the police keep them back? Get inside, Melba, now! The face of the gym teacher showed both compassion and alarm as she quietly pointed to a group of women some distance away, jumping over the rear fence as they shouted obscenities at me. Hurry! I started to run for my life. N, N, one woman cried, hot on my heels. Get the N. Three of them had broken away from the pack and were gaining on me. I was running at top speed when someone stuck out a foot and tripped me. I fell face forward, cutting my knee and elbow. Several girls moved closer, and for an instant, I hoped they were drawing near to extend a hand and ask me if they needed help. The N is down, one shouted. She's bleeding. What do you know? N bleed red blood. Let's kick the N. I saw the foot coming my way and grabbed it before I got to my face. I twisted at the ankle like I'd seen them do at wrestling matches. The girl fell backward. As I scrambled to my feet, I looked back to see the brigade of attacking mothers within striking distance shouting about how their kids weren't going to have me in school with their kids. I ran up the stairs, hoping I could find my way back to the office. With the mothers close on my heels, shouting their threats, the twisted maze of the hallway seemed even more menacing. I felt I could have gotten lost forever as I struggled to find the door that led to the office and safety. Opening first one, then another, I raced through a honeycomb of locker rooms and dead-end hallways. After several minutes of opening the wrong doors and bumping into people who'd hit me or called me names, I was in tears, ready to give up, paralyzed by my fear. Suddenly, Grandma's voice came into my head. God never loses one of his flock. Shepherd, show me how to go, I said. I stood still and replaced those words, repeated those words over and over again until I gained some composure. I wiped my eyes and then I saw blood running down my leg and onto my saddle shoe. It was too much. I pressed my thumb to the wounded area to try to stop the bleeding. I've been looking for you, the stocky guide's voice was angry, but I was glad to see her. I almost forgot myself and reached to hug her. And just where do you think you're going? You are only supposed to travel through the school with me. She looked at my leg but said nothing, then looked away. Yes, ma'am, but, but nothing. Let's go to shorthand class. She didn't know it, but she was the answer to my prayer. I looked over my shoulder to see the group of mothers standing still, obviously unwilling to come after me with the school office at my side. I choked back tears and speeded my step. Hello, honey. Welcome. We're just beginning. I'm Mrs. Pickwick. The warm voice of the tiny, dark-haired woman comforted me. Although she was petite, I quickly discovered that my shorthand teacher was definitely not one to tolerate any hanky-panky. When students moved away from me, hurling insults, she gave them a stir and reprimand. If you move, you move to the office and see the principal, she said without so much as a hint of compromise in her voice. As I headed for the last row of empty seats, by the window, she called out to me. Melba, stay away from the window. Her voice was sympathetic, as though she really cared what happened to me. As I turned back to follow her orders, I caught a glimpse of the crowd across the street from the front of the school. I was so transfixed by the sight, I couldn't move. The ocean of people stretched farther than I could see. Waves of people ebbing and flowing, shoving the saw horse and the policemen who were trying to keep them in place. There were lots of uniformed policemen, but the crowd must have outnumbered them a hundredfold. 
Every now and then, three or four people broke through and dashed across the street toward the front of the school. The police would run after them. Melba, please take your seat. Slowly, reluctantly, I turned away and stumbled to my seat. As I sat there trying to focus on the shorthand book before me, I could hear some of the things the crowd was shouting. Get the N and 2468. We ain't gonna integrate. Although I could not erase the images or the sounds of those people... <coughs> My apologies. Of those people outside, somehow Mrs. Pickwick was so sincere and determined to be as normal as possible that I actually listened to what she had to say about shorthand. I even managed to draw several shorthand characters on my tablet as the noise got louder and louder. I looked up from my notes to see my guide entering the door. She wore a frown and was red-faced and perspiring. Something was awfully wrong. It was written all over her face. Come with me now to the principal's office, she called out nervously. This time she collected my books and shoved them into my arms. I walked even faster than before. We were almost running. Don't stop for anything, she shouted at me over the noise. As I followed her through an inner office past very official-looking white men, I was alarmed by the anxious expressions on their faces. I was led to an adjoining anteroom, a smaller office, where some of the eight had gathered. Two of the girls were crying. I stood near the door, which was ajar enough so that, although I could not see who was speaking, I could hear much of the men's conversation. I heard their frantic tone of voice, heard them say the mob was out of control that they would have to call for help. What are we going to do about the children? Asked one. The crowd is moving fast. They've broken the bar barricades. These kids are trapped in here. Good Lord, you're right, another voice said. We, have, we may have to let the mob have one of the kids so we can distract them long enough to get the others out. Let one of those kids hang? How is that going to look? And or not, they are children, and we got a job to do. Hang one of us? They were talking about hanging one of my friends, or maybe even me? My knees were shaking so badly I thought I would fall over. I held my breath, trying not to make any noise. The two men discussing our fate were just on the other side of the door. I turned my back to the partially open door, at the same time moving closer to it so I could hear more. A man's voice said, They are children. What'll we do? Have them draw straws to see which one gets a rope around their neck? It may be the only way out. There must be a thousand people out there, armed and coming this way. Some of the, these patrolmen are throwing down their badges, another breathless voice said. We gotta get them out of here. I heard footsteps coming closer. I moved to the center of the room, closer to where my friend stood, surrounding Thelma, who sat on her haunches. A tall, raw-boned, dark-haired man came towards us. I'm Gene Smith, assistant chief of the Little Rock Police Department. He spoke in a calm tone. It's time for you to leave for today. Come with me now. Right away, I had a good feeling about him because of the way he introduced himself and took charge. He urged us to move faster, acting as though it mattered to him whether or not we got out. It's 11.30. I want you out of here before noon. Gene Smith. His was the voice I had heard in the next room, saying he would rather get all of us out than hang one to save the others. I decided to forever remember this man in my prayers. I scrambled to keep up with the others as we moved at a quick pace toward the 14th Street side of Central High. It was almost a block away, but suddenly Smith and the other men turned from the main hallway and began descending stairs into passageways that became more dim. What if they were going to kill us? I didn't really know these men, yet I had no choice but to trust them. I focused on speeding down the narrow concrete passageway, down the stairs into a dark cellar, where one of the men walking ahead of us switched on a flashlight. We were inside some of the basement garage. In the distance was a huge door that appeared to lift upward with a chain pulley. It resembled a loading dock of some kind. Two cars were sitting with engines running, lights on, hoods pointing towards the door. Hurry now, get in, Smith said as he held open one of the doors. I looked at the others getting into the second car. Thelma, Minnie Jean, and Ernie were in the car with me. A white man sat behind the wheel. He had absolutely terrified expression on his face. Roll your windows up, lock your doors, keep your faces away from the window, put your heads down when we start to move. He hunched over to secure something on the floor, and that's when I saw the gun strapped to his side in a leather holster. Smith leaned down to talk through the open window to the driver. Move fast and don't stop, no matter what. Then she looked at us and said, Listen to your driver's instructions and do exactly what he says. Your lives depend on it. We were surrounded by white men in suits, speaking in frightened tones. Their expressions told me we were in the kind of trouble I hadn't even imagined before. The enormous roaring sound came from the crowd just beyond the door made me wonder whether or not they had waited too long to get us into these cars. 
Just for one instant, I tried to imagine what would happen if the mob got a hold of us. Now, Smith shouted, let her roll. The driver shifted gears and gunned the engine as I crouched down in the back seat. Suddenly, I heard dragging. The basement door was opening, letting streaks of light, of sunlight in. I scooted farther down in my seat, hiding my face, but I decided I had to keep my eyes open. I wanted to know what was happening to me. At least that way, I know what to pray for. I felt the car surge ahead. We were climbing upward out of the basement towards bright sunlight. I could hear the tire spinning onto gravel driveway just beyond the door. The car gained momentum, lunging forward. As the full light of the day crept into the windows, the deafening noise of the mob engulfed us. Get the end. Hang the end. Stop those cars, I heard somebody shout. Then I saw wave after wave of white faces, angry white faces, everywhere. Their mouths were open, shouting threats. Clusters of white hands with fingers extended seemed for a moment to envelop us, clutching, grabbing at us. Some of the faces were moving along with us, coming closer to the car windows. Hold on and keep your heads down, the driver shouted. I heard the engine grind and felt us go faster. The people running beside us accelerated their pace, hurling rocks and sticks at the car. That's when the car really began to move fast, faster than I'd ever ridden before. Finally, there were fewer hands and faces on the car windows, and the noises subsided. I took a deep breath. You can sit up now, but keep an eye out. I could see that there were others in the car behind us were safe. We were mostly silent on our journey, craning our necks, keeping watch in every direction. Thank you for the ride home, I said to the driver as I climbed out of the car. He cast a pleasant but impatient glance my way. I wanted to say thanks for risking your life to save mine, but I didn't know how it would sound to the others. It was an awkward moment with a stranger, a decent white man. Get in the house now. Go, he said, pull, pausing for an instant, then gunning his engine and pulling away. I waved goodbye to my friends, standing at the curb for a moment. I peered after the car as it drove away, wondering if he would get into trouble with the segregationists when they found out he was the one who rescued us from the mob. He was the second white man I would pray for God to protect. I turned to see that some of my neighbors had gathered, a few sitting in our lawn chairs, a few standing around talking. I wondered what they were doing there. Then Grandma India rushed out of the front door, her arms open to receive me. Thank God you're safe. Your mama is on her way home. She was shoving me, both her hands at my back not letting me pause to say hello to the alarm neighbors who kept asking if I was all right. Now you've had your lesson. You don't have to go back to that awful school anymore, our neighbor, Mrs. Floyd said as Grandma ushered me past her. I settled down on the couch in front of the television with the radio blasting loud from the hallway. I sipped the grappetta soda Grandma had given me and thought about what the mob might have done to us. I worried that they would come looking for us at our homes. Although we had left shortly after noon, word came that the mob continued its rampage. Even after the Central High School Registrar came out to announce on a microphone that we had been removed, not everyone believed her. Instead, they surged forward, threatening to overrun the barricades and the police, demanding to see for themselves that only white students remained. A police officer convinced them to send representatives inside the school to check. When three women returned to report we were not there, the mob cheered but continued the siege. Armed with guns, ropes, and clubs, the report said they surged toward the school, in the doors and through the halls, dancing and shouting, two, four, six, eight, we ain't gonna integrate. Melba, where's Melba? Is she all right? Mother Lois came rushing into the living room, disheveled and frantic. I'm fine, Mama. I stood to embrace her. We've made a mistake. You're definitely not going back to that school. What's that on your knee, Grandma India asked. I fell. I decided I didn't need to add to Mother's nervousness. I would wait until she calmed down to explain the details of my day. I heard they passed the hat and collected $140 to encourage those policemen to abandon their duties, Grandma added. You must have been scared to death. I'm sorry, Mother said. We all listened as the newscast continued airing the sounds of the angry mob taking over the school. I discovered that one reason we were able to slip into the school that morning was that the mob had been preoccupied chasing and beating three black reporters, James Hicks, Alex Wilson, and Moses Newsom who they had accused of purposely distracting the crowd in order to allow us to get in the side door. Mr. Hills Wilson was hit on the head with a brick, and even as he lay wounded on the ground, they continued to kick and beat him. The mob had then turned to beat up white reporters. Several members of the Life magazine staff were beaten. Other newspeople and out-of-towners were chased and beaten until they reached police lines. Even after they were, in, after they were inside police cars, they were showered with rocks. A concerned and flustered Conrad rushed into the house to greet me. His friend Clark had told him I was dead. 
In order to settle him down, Grandma busied him with helping her fix lunch. I remained glued to the news, mulling over whether or not I should tell them what really happened to me that day. I decided it would only make things worse, and maybe it would make them decide I could never go back to the in back to the integration. Later on, we got a hold of a copy of the evening newspaper, the Arkansas Democrat. The paper was filled with pictures of the crowd and the police trying to dis desperately to control it. Only by looking at those pictures did I begin to understand the real danger of that mob. In my diary, I wrote, There seems to be no space for me at Central High. I don't want integration to be like the merry-go-round. Please, God, make space for me. The phone started to ring nonstop with calls from angry strangers spewing hatred and threats. There were also calls from our family and friends inquiring about my safety and warning us that the mob was continuing to search out and beat up people in our neighborhood. One phone call came from a news reporter who asked what I felt about the situation. Before mother or grandma caught on to what I was doing, I told him. He complimented me saying I was articulate and asked if I could write. And asked if I, could write. I said yes and he asked if I would write an article about my first morning at Central. Right there, I jotted down a few notes and started dictating the article to him as it came to my head, the way I wrote letters to God every night in my diary. All the while I was talking to the reporter, I kept our instructions in mind. Accentuate the positive. Don't complain too much. He said my story would appear in the newspaper everywhere just as I had written it, because it was on the Associated Press wire. Sure enough, the next day, I saw it on the front page. Would you have exchanged places with me and entered Central as I did this morning? I went, and I'm glad. Previous to making actual entrance into Central, I had feelings that I'm sure, I'm sure have never been experienced by a child of 15 years. Sensations of courage, fear, and challenge haunted me. With the morning came my definite decision. I must go. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted him, and I am helped. With this verse in mind and a hopeful prayer in my heart, I entered the halls of Central High. The spacious halls brought again the school feeling. However, the atmosphere was not conducive to study, but one of uneasiness. The sea of faces represented no special personality to me. Although some were kind, many showed contempt, especially some boys gathered in the halls. I was beginning to believe that the long, hard fight was over, that finally this American way of life was going to pay off. As I walked through the halls alone, it seemed as if I were lost on an island, an island of strange people, having no way of communicating with them. I longed to tell them, I won't hurt you. Honest, give me a chance. Come on, how about it? I'm an average teenager, just like yourself, with the same aspirations and heartaches, but it was useless. Only a few expressions told me I had gotten through. Each time, as I was about to give up, exhausted from the jeers and insulting remarks, some kind of face would come up and say, I want you here, or you're pretty, or won't you stay and fight it out? This above all made, I'm sorry, this above all made all the go home and, and I'm going to get you before the day is over fade into the background. There were a few trying experiences such as being blocked from passage to class by a few rough, tough looking sideburners, boys who I'm sure if separated would not attack a mouse. Then there were the three women who jumped the fence and attempted to get me. A favorite activity of the kids was to form a group in a circle and scream, two, four, six, eight, we ain't gonna integrate. I know of no physical injury to any of the nine students. I was slapped by one girl. I turned, said thank you, and continued on my journey to class. I did not realize the size or the intentions of the crowd outside until I was told for my safety I had to leave Central High. This hurt me deeper than I can ever express. I am glad I went, oh so glad I went, for now I know with out-of-school inf inf interference, integration is possible in Little Rock, Arkansas. When I finished the article, I realized it was not the whole truth, but a version that wouldn't jeopardize the integration. If I had told what really happened, one of the officials might say we couldn't go back. I composed the story in a way that would make my days sound okay. Maybe in a few days, if I remained patient and prayed, it would really be that way. White students would welcome me and smile and treat me like an ordinary human being. All that evening, we continued our vigilance on the couch in front of the television. From his Sea Island, Georgia retreat, Governor Favis urged our leaders and school officials to allow a cooling off period before resuming integration. President Eisenhower issued a warning statement. I will use the full power of the United States, including whatever force may be necessary to prevent any obstruction of the law and to carry out the orders of the federal court. But even after the president's warning, early Tuesday morning, the mob gathered in front of Central High and continued their rampaging.